Hey, good morning, church. This is the day the Lord has made, amen? And we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, what a privileged opportunity to be a part of the New Hope community uh, this weekend and this special weekend of your 30th anniversary and the continued turning your attention to the world. And uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, not just being a healthy local church, but a local church that's having a global impact. You know, missions um, is not a denominational obligation. It's a commitment that says we really do believe everybody has a right to taste and see that the Lord is good. And uh, you are doing some incredible, incredible things for the kingdom of God. And uh, it's interesting. Did you know that uh, in the world, there are 10 times more Assemblies of God churches than there are McDonald's restaurants? And that's because churches like New Hope uh, have a compassion, have a conviction uh, that everybody has a right to taste and see that the Lord is good. So thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for your commitment and congratulations on 30 years of outstanding ministry effectiveness. And I think you would agree with me, right? The best is yet to come. Amen. I want to talk to you today a little bit about why missions why you, why us? There's a legend that recounts the return of Jesus back to heaven after his time here on earth. He bore the marks in his body, the scars, the bruises of a cruel cross, crucifixion, and a shameful death. And, and the legend accounts that Gabriel approached him and said, Lord, was it really as bad as it seems? He said it was. Well, Master, you must have suffered terribly at the hands of humanity on earth. He said, I did. Well, Gabriel continued, do, do they know how much you loved them? Do they, they know how much your death means to them? Uh, Jesus said, not yet. Only a handful of people in Palestine really comprehend that. So Gabriel was perplexed and, and somewhat frustrated and frowning, and he says, well then, what have you done about that? What have you done to make sure more people know how much your death means to them? Jesus said, well, I told Peter, I told James, I told John and a few more friends, and I told them to tell other people about me and my love for them. I'm hopeful that that will spread throughout humanity and that this message will be received in the hearts of people. Gabriel then frowned and looked kind of skeptical and, and said, yeah, but what if Peter and James and John and all those people, what if they lose their passion? What if they don't tell other people? What happens if it stops in their generation? Jesus says, well, I don't have any other plans. I'm counting on them. And interestingly, 21 centuries later, Jesus still has no other plans. He's counting on you, he's counting on me to contribute his work of reconciling himself to the world so that other people can come to know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad somewhere in your journey Somebody told you that God loved you and that God has a plan for your life. You see, since the fall of man, God's intention to reunite himself with humanity has always been there. You can see it from Genesis to Revelation. You can see it to the activity that he's doing here on earth. It's God's desire to reconcile himself to humanity. And so it's my prayer this morning for a few moments as we just reflect on why it's so embedded in the DNA of this church to take this gospel around the world that we'll just, we'll take a break from looking at life horizontally. <laughs> Can't life get discouraging if you just view it horizontally? Doesn't life get discouraging if you just develop a perspective on life from Fox or CNN? <laughs> In fact, most Christians ought to take a, a Fox news break or a CNN news break sometime just to, just to kind of recalibrate and consider a vertical perspective. 
Look at life from God's view. What is, what's God's view of mission? What's God's view of humanity? What's God's view of compassion? And as we look for a few moments vertically, I pray that well, the Lord will just sort of motivate our hearts to reach one more for Jesus. Just to reach one more for Jesus. Why missions? Why us? Why, why you? First of all, because Christ died for everyone. Hey, would you say that with me? Christ died forever. Come on, say it again. Christ died for everyone. Yeah, that was the first public declaration or description of Jesus when John the Baptist says, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was a game changer. Think about it, up to that point, humanity had been relying on the, the blood of sacrificial lambs to atone for their sins, and thousands of lambs were slaughtered, but God comes along and provides the perfect sacrifice, his son, his only begotten son, that the writer of Hebrews says, Christ appeared once for all to put away sin by sacrificing himself. That's why, as a church, we focus on the Great Commission. That's why we do missions, because Christ died for all of us. It's a part of God's natures to always provide for us. I think about in the Old Testament, remember the story of Abraham when he was taking his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed? And Isaac is walking with his dad and he says, Father, I, I, I see the wood and I know there's an altar, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says, don't worry about that, Isaac. God himself will provide the lamb. And God has. God did provide a lamb for Abraham, and God provided a lamb for us when he gave us his son, his only begotten son. So, church, when we realize all of the implications of Christ's death on a cross, then we should go beyond just missional thinking. We should go beyond missional talking. We should be moved into missional action because there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, the one and only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. Why do we do missions? Yeah, we do missions because Christ died for everyone. Secondly, we do missions because People everywhere need Jesus. People everywhere need Jesus. Now it's true. The spread of Christianity since the birth of Jesus has been absolutely amazing, actually supernatural. But just because the gospel has gone to every political country in the world doesn't mean that it's reached every people group. Let me help you with that. There are about 7,000 unreached people groups around the world. And an unreached people group is a community of people with less than 2% Christian. Now watch this. Over 42% of the world's population live in these 7,000 unreached people groups. None of them have, have an indigenous church capable of taking the gospel to their community. That's why we do missions, so that people can respond. I find it interesting in today's culture, we have a great tendency to, to label people, either by their political persuasion or by their ethnicity or by their religious belief. And sometimes, if we only look at the label, we're not as motivated to want to reach them for Christ. But can I tell you, regardless of what a culture and a society labels people, every human being bears the image of Jesus. Every human being has the capacity to say yes to God. So missions is all about bringing the presence of hope, bringing the presence of Jesus to people who've never experienced his presence. Thinking about the power of presence, I'm reminded of... Uh, uh, an incident I had with my grandson, Jackson. Are, are there any grandparents in the house? Can I see your hand? Yeah. Isn't grandparenting wonderful? <laughs> you know, I, I, I get it. The reason why grandparents and grandkids get along so well, it's because we have the same common enemy, their parents. 
So we have seven, and the oldest is seven, the youngest is one, and uh, Jackson is the oldest grandson. And about two years ago, I decided it's time for Jackson to have his first overnighter at Papa's house. Now his mom, my firstborn, it took a lot for us to try to convince her that it was, it was okay for, for Jackson to have an overnighter at Papa's house. He worked on her, I worked on her, we finally got her to consent, and so I'll never forget, I went over to pick him up, and Jackson was standing there in the doorway, he had a Spider-Man backpack just jammed full of everything, and, and I was there, and I said, Jackson, he says, Papa, I said, you ready to come over? Yeah, I am, and he bolted out, we turned and started walking to my car, and all of a sudden, Ashley, his mom, my firstborn, said, uh, Dad, Dad? And I said, yeah. And I turned around, and she handed me a three-by-five card <laughs> that had a set of six very specific instructions on it. I started reading these instructions. I got to instruction number three, dad, comma, after 6 p.m., please make sure you put two parts water, one part apple juice in his sippy cup. I'm thinking, first of all, we don't do mixed drinks at Papa's house. <laughs> We're 100% Dr. Pepper at Papa's house. <laughs> Two parts water, one part apple. Yeah, right. I got in the car. I ripped that sucker up. I said, come on, Jackson. We're going to have a great time. And, and we did. We watched some Paw Patrol cartoons. We played games. Uh, it came time for him to get his bath and jammies on. And about that, about that time, a southwest Missouri storm whipped up. I mean, it was a doozy, loud thunder, crackling lightning, and I could tell Jackson was feeling a little anxious. So I said, little buddy, do you want to sleep in Papa's room? Yeah, yeah, I do. So I threw some blankets down and some pillows, and I just made this little sleeping area down from beside my, by my bed. So he laid down there, and boom, a crack of thunder would hit. He'd jump up. I say, buddy, you're okay. That thunder on the outside can't hurt you on the inside. And he lay down, another flash of lightning, he'd jump up. This happened three or four times. I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever said something that you don't know where it came from, and it got out there before you could reel it back in? Because what I said to Jackson after about the fourth time, Papa, I, it makes no meteorological sense, it makes no theological sense, but it just came out. He jumped up and he was there and I said, Jackson, you don't have to be afraid of thunder. Thunder is nothing more than just God moving his furniture up in heaven. <laughs> don't judge me, you would have put Robitussin in his sippy cup, woman, don't judge me. He said, oh, okay, he laid down. Crack of thunder hit, he didn't jump up. I'm like, cool, I'll let his kids pastor work on his theology, I just want him to fall asleep. And flash of lightning, nothing happened. Like, this is great, this is great. So I rolled over and I was just about, to, just about to doze off and a loud reverberating thunder happened and, and I'm laying this way and come on grandparents, you know we've got it. We've got this extra sense within us and I could just feel a set of eyes looking at me. I could just feel. Sure enough, when I rolled over, he wasn't standing all the way up. He was just peering above the mattress. So the just, just, just peering above the mattress. His eyes were wide. And before I could say anything to him, Jackson said, Papa, you think that I could lay with you till God quits moving his furniture? <laughs> I said, you bet, little buddy. So I picked him up and I plopped him down. And church, within 30 seconds, he was out. He was out. I couldn't convince him that the storm on the outside wouldn't hurt him, but as long as he was in close proximity to Papa, he felt secure enough to rest enough to fall asleep. I think some people who are trapped by the label that they wear, either their sexual identity, their ethnicity, their political identity, don't realize that Jesus really is as close as the mention of his name, and they don't have to be defined by the label they wear. They can be defined by becoming a child of God. So we do missions, because people everywhere need to experience the presence of Jesus 
to be able to accept Jesus. We do missions because we do believe eternity is real and it's gonna begin someday real soon. Eternity is real and it's gonna begin someday real soon. See, we believe in the reality of heaven and we believe in the reality of hell. Now, I get it. When it comes to social issues, I am so glad that the Pentecostal church believers demonstrate compassion. We're involved in biblical justice. We want to reach out <clears throat> to people who are suffering uh, physically and, and trapped in, 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 in life addictions. But hear me, New Hope, if the church is only marked by our compassion for the immediate and we're not motivated to respond to the eternal suffering of people, then we're really just a defective church. If all we're interested is giving a cup of cold water and not interested in seeing someone birthed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light, it's not either or, it's both and. Because there really is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I would submit to you that the sins that Jesus died for that are enough to warrant punishment, so too the grace that Jesus displayed on the cross is significant to assure people eternal life. In fact, that's what Paul meant in Romans when he said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we do missions not out of a denominational obligation. We do missions because we believe everybody has the right to taste and see that the Lord is good. We do missions because we want the next generation of our church to catch the spirit of doing commission activity, great commission activity. We want the next generation of this church to pick up the spirit of reaching people for Jesus. I gotta tell you, I, I don't want just my children and grandchildren to have a heart of generosity, and I want that. I don't want them to just have a heart of compassion, and I want them to have that. I want them to have a heart for lost people. I want them to have a heart for people that don't know the Lord. I want them to have a heart for people who are wandering or trapped in their sins and they don't even realize they are. You know, New Hope, if we're not intentional in equipping the next generation to be great commission Christians, then what can happen, minds, uh, uh, just a maintenance mindset can set in. And when maintenance mindset sets in in a church, that's a death nail. You say, Doug Clay, what's a maintenance mindset? Well, when the upkeep of programs distracts you from kingdom advancement, that's a maintenance mindset. When worship becomes nothing more than just a weekly buzz rather than being catalyst for going out and advancing the kingdom of God. When pastoring becomes more like a religious service rather than mobilizing and equipping people to use their gifts to advance the kingdom of God. When discipleship becomes nothing more than just a sanctified version of self-help stuff rather than recruiting and training people for a life of service. So thank you, thank you, thank you, New Hope, for not becoming a maintenance-minded church when it comes to kingdom advancement. You know, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that you're not letting the fear and the intimidation of what we've been going through the last few months to keep you from being the church. I've been grateful. Just because services have canceled doesn't mean the church has been canceled. And so thank you. Thank you for learning how to pivot. Thank you for not, thank you for getting it. Thank you for understanding that the strength of New Hope is not just how we feel in a one-hour service on a Sunday, but what we do Monday through Saturday. 
And I want the next generation of the church to understand what it means to really be the church. Because sometimes when you have a, a lack of understanding of a role, it can be kind of confusing and sometimes embarrassing. Again, I'll never forget about a year ago, I took the three oldest grandkids down to Silver Dollar City. Silver Dollar City is a little amusement park in Branson, Missouri, and they have a kids area, so I was taking Allie and Jackson and Callum down there. That would be, a, 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 at the time, a six, a five, and a four-year-old. And uh, Allie, the oldest, uh, started asking me, Papa, what's the general superintendent do? This kind of, what do you do? I just tried to explain, well, we have these churches, and I work with churches and pastors, and Callum pipes up, so you're kind of like the president to a lot of pastors, aren't you? And I said, well, no, I don't really tweet like that, but it's sort of like that a little bit. And they were just really inquisitive. What's a general superintendent do? And I, I, I wasn't sure I was able to fully convey it, but uh, we got to the park and uh, quickly their attention and their focus was on getting in and getting some rides. So we went down to the kids area and we immediately started the little kids roller coaster area. So we're standing in line and they're being six, five, and four in terms of their behavior, they're, they're anxious, they're swinging on the ropes that separate the lines and they're looking and, and it, it seemed like eternity to them, but it was only about 10 minutes had passed. And all of a sudden, Jackson just said, Papa, can you go up there and tell them you're the general superintendent and can we get line cuts? <laughs> I desperately want in our church to make sure the next generation understands why we're so committed to Great Commission activity. It's not an obligation, it's not some tradition we're trying, we're motivated because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God has no other plan of taking this gospel around the world, but through us. So that's why we do missions. Fifthly, we do missions because I personally believe there's a missional blessing that comes to those who participate in missions, whether it's giving, going, praying, participating. Say, Pastor Clay, do you really believe that? I, I do. Psalm chapter 67 verse 7 says this, May God bless us still so that the ends of the earth will fear him. May God bless us still so that the ends of the earth may fear him. Some of you know my story. I'm a third generation Pentecostal preacher's kid. I was born and raised in this thing. I cut my teeth in the back of church pews. My mom was the minister of music. My dad was the pastor. Uh, I love the church. Um, in fact, I fell asleep many Sunday nights in a church pew. <laughs> I was left a few times on a Sunday night. Mom thought dad was going to take me home. Dad thought mom was going to take me home. Can I tell you, a church is a spooky place to wake up when the lights are out and you're all alone. You can sing all you want, God is good, raise a hallelujah, but when you wake up and the lights are out, it can be kind of startling. I knew which Sunday school teacher served the best snacks, so if the altar service got going a little long, I would sneak out, I would go to that Sunday school supply closet, and I would chow down on those snacks. When I was nine years old, my dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack. He was nine, my brother was 15, my sister was 18. You know, I never really felt the negative impact of um, ra being raised by a single mom because I was a part of a great church, just a, a lot like New Hope. I had spiritual dads who helped me build my Pinewood Derby cars. I had youth sponsors that would take me to Detroit Tiger baseball games. So I kind of grew up feeling sorry for kids who only had one dad because I had all these spiritual dads in my world. It's in the context of the local church that I felt the call of God on my life, and I took off and I went to Bible school, and that's my story and my journey. Perhaps the single greatest influence in my life is 
my mom, my 89-year-old mom, who's still just trucking for Jesus today. She called me this morning, wanted to know where I was at, wanted to know what I was preaching. Honey, do you have a fresh message or is it something you've preached before? God forgive me, Father, for not telling her necessarily the truth. And um, <laughs> she calls me every week, wants to know, where are you at, what are you doing? And then has a word of prayer with me. About a year ago, no, it was actually 2017, um, she was 87 at the time, and I'm thinking, she's not slowing down. She's not slowing. I got to figure, how's she doing? How? I said, Mom, how you doing? How you doing finding? Oh, honey, honey, God is faithful. God takes care. I, I know, but how are you doing financial? Honey, I'm doing great. God's. I said, Mom, how are you? Honey, honey, God is faithful. She's from that school. So I convinced her. I said, Mom, why don't you send me a copy of your 2016 tax returns? At the time, I was the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. I think, I, I need to look out and see how she's doing. I want to make sure she's doing okay. All right, honey, I'll send those to you. So my then 87-year-old mom sent me a copy of her 2017 tax returns. I noticed that her income was about $27,500, primarily, most of it primarily from Social Security, a little bit there from uh, interest off some retirement. And I began scanning that, and I got over to the charitable contributions, all to Bethany Assembly of God, Adrian, Michigan. And I noticed that in 2016, my mom gave $17,250 to missions. I, I said, Mom, you got to throttle that. Honey, 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 you can't outgive God. Well, I'm the youngest. I figure I'm going to call my older sister, and she's going to have to deal with this. So I called my sister. I said, Doug, you got to deal with this. Mom's giving away everything. She said, Doug, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> I thought about it this morning after our phone conversation. I said, Mom, what's your day hold for you? Well, I'm going to first service. I got to play the piano and the kids here. Second service, I'm going to be meeting with the prime timers. Then this afternoon, I've got to go to this nursing home in ministry. And I'm thinking, here's an 89-year-old widow. I've never went without. Our family's never went without. She has a great, she has a commitment to great commission causes. And she's right. Honey, 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 God is faithful. And to be honest with you, I think I'm the, I'm the benefactor of my mom's sacrifice. You see, oftentimes when you sacrifice, that frees you up from being trapped by some things that can, that can cause you spiritual injury. You let go of some things in the name of sacrifice, in the name of giving. And so she was free from trying to keep up with the Joneses. She was free from material grief. She was free, and now three children later, seven grandchildren later, 16 great-grandchildren later, all loving Jesus and serving the Lord. You can't tell me that there's not a missional blessing that's associated when someone participates in great commission participation. So I'm the product of Psalm 67, 7. May God bless us still so that the ends of the earth will fear him. Hammond asked the team if they'd come back. Thanks, Austin. So yeah, why missions? Why us? Why you? Because it's so close to the heart of God. I thought about uh, this service. I thought about the combination of the 30th anniversary of what God's been doing in your midst and the heart of your pastor that wants to keep going, keep going, keep reaching. And I was reminded this morning of the feeding of the 5,000. And I thought, you know, there's a parallel with that miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 in this church called New Hope. Remember that story? 
You can read about it in all of the Gospels. In fact, it's one of the only miracles outside of uh, Jesus' resurrection that's recounted in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So it's obvious that the truth of this miracle uh, was really intended to have an impact. Jesus, the Bible says there are 5,000 men on the mountainside, and so you know that there were probably 10,000 total with women and children. And Jesus recesses. It's noon. And he says, all right, what do we have to feed them? There have been no preparations. Simon, Peter's brother, says, well, hey, here's a little lad. He's got five loaves, two fish. But Peter says, I don't know how far that'll go among so many. And so Jesus says, well, bring it here. And he starts blessing it. And he puts it in their baskets. And you know the story. A miracle takes place. I think about that miracle and there's a couple of impressions that it leaves with me. First of all, the disciples could have been incredibly intimidated by the size of the task. Twice in John's gospel, the crowd was described as great. They knew how limiting their resources were. So they could have been intimidated by the size of the task. But I think, I think some of those disciples had that spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Remember Joshua and Caleb? They were a part of a 12-man reconnaissance team that went out to spy the land. Can we go in and conquer it? Ten of those of the 12 came back and said, oh, there's no way. They compared themselves to the enemy and said, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb compared the enemy to God and said, oh, absolutely we can do it. We can make this happen. When it comes to going forward, when it comes to completing the building, when it comes to planning another church like you've done in Cedar Rapids. Don't ever let the size of an opportunity intimidate you. And secondly, when I look at the miracle of the feeding of 5,000, I'm reminded how easily it would have been for the disciples to be fearful by how little resources they had. Twice, the Bible says, five small loaves, two small fish. But thirdly, I'm kind of reminded of the mindset that at least Jesus had and hopefully cast in front of his disciples. They had a mindset that says, you know what? With God, all things are possible. And then it was demonstrated. I mean, you think about it. Five loaves plus two fish, not enough. But five loaves plus two fish plus one Jesus, that's more than enough. That's more than enough. This church has been a recipient of a more than enough God for 30 years. And I promise you, El Shaddai, the God of plenty, the all-sufficient one, is still going to be a more than enough God for you as you continue to advance forward in the name of the Lord. So thank you, New Hope. Thank you. For the 42% of the world that live in those unreached people groups that just need to have the presence of Jesus brought to them, thank you for your commitment to helping them taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, Lord, I thank you for this great church, its great leadership, and the obvious blessing of the Lord that's canopying this ministry. I pray in the strong name of Jesus that you would continue to anoint their steps. Anoint their kingdom initiatives. Anoint their outreach. Anoint. I pray, Lord, between now and the end of the year, it would be the greatest harvest for New Hope. That people online, people coming and visiting, people who are a part of uh, relationships with this church even in these times, would come to know Jesus Christ. Let us see people beyond the label that they get a, 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 a attached with, and let us see that there's somebody created in the image of God who has the capacity to say yes to you. May your good hand of blessing reside on new hope, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.